Okay, thank you very much for a nice introduction. And I'm thankful for the invitation uh, to this uh, Neurosciences Society. So my topic is a little different because it's a hematological malignancies and disorders. So I will try my best to explain, but if there is any question, you, you can ask me. So, so there are four different types of leukemia. Uh, so acute lymphocytic leukemia, acute myelogenous leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and chronic myelogenic leukemia. So these leukemia, they are different because of the, like, um, the, the quickly, how quickly they are progressing. For example, the acute lymphocytic leukemia uh, grow very quickly. Uh, the acute myelogenous leukemias are also growing very quickly. And the other two uh, leukemias, they are growing slowly. Uh, the acute lymphocytic leukemia and acute myelogenous, uh, acute lymphocytic leukemia is like found in children. And it's like a very, very uh, like aggressive disease and the survival rate if the patient are not treated is still six months. Uh, so I will discuss today about the two types of leukemia um, because the uh, common gene BCR abl is involved in both of these leukemias, so chronic myeloid leukemia and acute lymphocytic leukemia. So as I told, acute lymphocytic leukemia is very aggressive and the survival is six months if the patients are not treated. And this disease is found mostly in children and the adult 37% of the patient ILL patients are positive for Philadelphia chromosome, uh, which is also cause of the chronic myeloid leukemia. Chronic myeloid leukemia, on the other hand, grows slowly. It's common in adult, and the survival is five to six years. Uh, there are three different stages of the chronic myeloid leukemia. So there is a chronic phase, accelerated phase, and then is a blast crisis. And the uh, chronic phase, uh, the survival, so the, there are 10 to 15 percent of the blast cells, and they are increasing in the accelerated phase, and finally, in the blast cases, there are more than 30 percent cells. So the, the survival uh, in chronic phase is after six years, in accelerated phase, it's uh, uh, six to nine months, and the blast crisis three to six months, which is similar like acute lymphocytic leukemia. As I told, the common cause of this disease is uh, Philadelphia chromosome. So what is Philadelphia chromosome? Philadelphia chromosome is the translocation between two chromosomes, chromosome nine and chromosome 22. Part of chromosome nine fused with uh, chromosome uh, 22 and a result in a new chromosome known Philadelphia chromosome, uh, which is here. And at the fusion, there are two genes fused. One is BCR, which is coming from chromosome 22, and the other is ABL, which is coming from chromosome 9. And this uh, you can see in the G bending that at the chromosome 22, you see, you see a small chromosome, one small chromosome, and at the 9 position, you see there is a larger chromosome. So the part of the today talk were like for drug therapy or drug or therapy development against resistant leukemia, uh, mechanism of resistance in these two diseases, and finally gene editing in beta thalassemia and sickle anemia. So I'm starting from the first part, uh, molecular targeting, uh, like to target BCR ABL as I told is the fusion uh, protein uh, responsible for both the disease. A chronic myeloid leukemia and acute lymphocytic leukemia. This BCR ABL is a constitutive active kinase, uh, which transform, which regulate different pathways, deregulate different pathways, and finally transform the cells to leukemic form. So there are different approaches uh, for targeting this protein. So the first one, which is widely used, is ATP competitors. Uh, the second one is oligomerization inhibitor, and then Elastic inhibitors and finally signaling pathways. So, how the ATP competitors are working? So, this is very simple like normally ATP is binding with the ATP binding site in the APL, you see here, uh, and uh, which uh, phosphorylate the BCR ABL. Uh, BCR ABL further phosphorylate the uh, uh, downstream signaling, for example, the uh, MAP 
Kinase, GX state, and AKT pathway. And finally, the cells are transformed. Uh, the PKI tyrosine kinase inhibitor, for example, martanib, the sartanib, the lotanib, ponartanib, they all bind to the tyrosine, the ATP binding site. And then there is a competition between ATP and these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which is uh, not allowing ATP to bind there, and their BCR ABL is regulated, and there is no further uh, uh, deregulation of the pathways. So tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, have some challenges. For example, the first tyrosine kinase inhibitor developed was imartanib, uh, and approved in 2001 for uh, chronic myeloid leukemia. And at that time, it was uh, like considered that this is like a very, very important and the first molecular therapy. But as you see here uh, in these older um, um, uh, trials, that the survival of the disease-free survival is very low. And it's like after 24 months, the incidence of relapse is nearly 70%. So the reason of this relapse and this resistance is uh, uh, the reason of this relapse is mostly resistance and resistance is because of the point mutation and the ABL. So ABL uh, has many many mutations. Like every month, a new mutation is coming, uh, and there are like now number of uh, mutations which are. Uh, giving resistance to tyrosine kinase inhibitor, but the most important was T315I mutation, uh, which was considered the global mutation, which was uh, not targetable by any tyrosine kinase inhibitors at that time. But in 2012, uh, a drug developed, which is known ponartanib, and this ponartanib was able to target all known uh, tyrosine uh, ABL mutations, including T3. T315I. So this was like um, a revolution in the field. Uh, but the problem with this punatory uh, came and it was the problem were like they were highly active only in CML chronic phase, but not in the advanced phase. They were not active in compound mutations, uh, not active in patients with non-mutational resistance. And the undesired side effects were like blood clots, blood narrowing of blood vessels, and high blood pressure and blindness, heart failure, stroke, etc. So that's why in 2012 this drug was taken away from the trial, uh, from uh, and like then the concentration, the dose is reduced, and now this is the market uh, in the market, but uh, given only to the adult patient or to the patient who are not like uh, who have no secondary problem like transplant or pregnant or some other problems. So. It means that there was an urgent uh, need of a new drug, which is uh, similarly potent, but also safe. So we, with a company, uh, Fusion Pharmaceutical, uh, we plan to develop a drug, which is known as P114, and the commercial name is Uamotanib. Uh, this drug was developed based on the problems uh, in Punatanib. For example, uh, we have one, then was to render repulsion with the main carbonyl chain uh, of the present in the main ATP binding site uh, in the off targets. Uh, like, for example, we replace oxygen with the nitrogen, uh, and then we also replace uh, the nitrogen with oxygen in another place. So these are like important that I'm discussed with the chemist, and these are like two examples uh, of modifications to be more safer. This drug was. Uh, so in the kinase profiling, we saw that this drug is comparatively safe. So if you see at the same concentration, ponartanib has like uh, 56 of tar targets, but the TF114 has 10 or even less than 10 targets. So this was uh, in the first uh, kinase profiling, we have seen that this drug is safer compared to ponartanib. Uh, so we did different in to experiment, but I show you here only the in view experiment. And you see here that uh, we uh, what how we do the in view experiment. So we have different models, for example, the syngenic mouse model, where we take the bone marrow cell from the, uh, from the mice. Uh, we isolate the uh, hematopoietic stem cells, and uh, we then uh, transduce these cells with the BCR-ABL construct. We irradiate the recipient mice, 
and transplant the mice with the uh, new cells with BCR ABL. And mostly we get like, for example, 95% of the of the in the mice we get CML like disease, and then the one to five percent ALL mice. So we do the survival curves and all other uh, 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 phenotypes of the mice. And we have shown here that the P114 has uh, extended the survival of the mice uh, significantly uh, in the white type BCR ABL and also in this resistant form, which is known as P315I. Uh, similarly, like not anywhere, even badly. Uh, in another new mass uh, experiment, we also uh, we took the leukemic cells, the KFF6, KFF6 2 cells, and these cells were uh, transplanted in the mice subcutaneously, and the mice were treated for nearly uh, like 10 days or uh, two weeks. And you see here it, that with the P14, 40 milligram per kilogram of mice. Uh, the disease was was completely treated and and uh, even relapsed. So it was like very interesting till under 40 days, which is too long for the mice. So it was like very very appreciated. Uh, this drug is as uh, we told that it is in the phase three clinical trial, but it is given to the patient unlimited uh, uh, like uh, to limited patients uh, if there is no alternative available. So this is the part of the, um, the uh, ATP competitors. So uh, the next approach is oligomerization inhibition. So as you see here that the bcr the, the N-terminus has a coil coil. And because of this coil coil, the bcr they fuse with each other and you find bcr not uh, as a single bcr but like uh, many BCR able together. And because of this BCR able fusion, they are, uh, this oligomerization uh, increase the kinase activity of the BCR able, regulate the kinases, and therefore the leukemia is uh, uh, like uh, result in leukemia. So, one approach is if we can uh, uh, inhibit this oligomerization using some. Uh, Peptides are using some way that how to uh, to make them uh, monomers uh, will lead to, uh, for example, to the inhibition of leukemia. So if you see here, uh, there were different ways. Like uh, uh, what we did, we we deleted the coil, coil from the BCR well and uh, transduced these cells, uh, the cells with this construct and this leukemia was inhibited. Was published in 2009 that time, and then. The different ways, but what then we plan to introduce the coil coil domain. So we introduce this coil coil for the competition and the coil coil fuse with the coil coil of the BCR ABL. So there is no fusion of the BCR ABL with each other. So there is also oligomerization inhibition. And further, what we did is uh, we reduced the size of this coil coil uh, domain. Uh, like there are two helices, helix one and helix two. Uh, of the coil coil domain, and we found that only helix 2 is bind binding with the BCR ABL, which means that helix 2 is the relevant structure of for inhibition. We confirmed that uh, by showing different, uh, doing different experiment, and if you see here that the phosphorylation of the BCR ABL using two different antibodies like 412 and 245. Uh, the the phosphorylation of the BCR ABL with different mutation is decreased. You see the in the red. So it means that the helix two is uh, sufficient for inhibiting the BCR ABL kinase activity. We did the in vitro experiment, and here is the proliferation competition assay. So on the left side is control cell. This is also LL cell line, but without BCR ABL. This is Philadelphia chromosome negative ALL. We have sub 15 cell line, which is Philadelphia chromosome positive, and BV173. And you see here that the helix 2 peptide, they are inhibiting the proliferation of the BCR ABL and also the leukemic cells. We also did the artificial system where we take the buff 3 cell, which are uh, taken from the uh, mice, and these cells, these are uh, pro B cells. 
You transduce this cell with the different constructs of BCRABL, for example, wild type BCRABL and different mutations. And you see that the helix 2 alone are in combination with the martanib efficiently inhibit the proliferation of these cells. Uh, currently, what I'm doing is so after that, uh, helix 2, the sharpening the structure of the coil, coil, then the plan was how to introduce that. Uh, helix 2 to the cell. So there were different approach we are trying uh, to introduce that as a drug. So because what I have shown you is the retroviral infection, but we want to do this like to use this as a drug. So I use some uh, uh, like um, some peptides which are taken from the HIV known that domain of the HIV and fused that with the um, helix 2 peptide and they were very, very easily injectable to uh, the cells in vitro system, also in NVU system. Uh, then further, what I plan uh, to make this one-time therapy, so not to use every time there. So the plan now, uh, currently I'm working on that as a funded project uh, that I develop a construct with the Helix 2 on one side, signal peptide on the other side, which is uh, for releasing of the peptide and then HIV tet, which is for the entry of the other uh, to the other cells. So this construct is introduced to the mesenchymal stem cells, and these mesenchymal stem cells, once we introduce us in the mice, will release the peptide because of this uh, signaling peptide. And when they are in the surrounding, because of this HIV tet domain, they will be taken by the surrounding leukemic cells. So the mesenchymal cell, cell stem cell will be for longer time or forever there. So they, because they give rise to the new cells, and these cells will all like uh, producing the helix 2 peptide, and the peptide will be taken up by the leukemic cells. So that will be, I we are thinking that that is a one-time therapy, is like a cell therapy. So the next approach is allosteric inhibition, and uh, I work on that for a long time. And uh, the first, uh, so how this uh, allosteric uh, compounds works. Uh, so, if you see here, so it's a, a comparatively complicated, uh, but the ABL, uh, BCR ABL, so one part is ABL. So, all of us, we have ABL gene, uh, and this ABL is uh, auto-inhibited because the, the first part of this ABL are the exon, the first exon of ABL is meristillated, and this meristillated part binds to the meristyl binding pocket in the kinase domain. And because of this conformation change, there is an auto inhibition. That's why all people, they have ABL, but they don't have leukemia. But in case of bcr -ABL, so as I told, there is a, a translocation of, uh, of chromosomes. So chromosomes are broken. So the one part of the ABL is gone, and that is taken up by the BCR. And this meristillated part is no more here, and because of that, the kinase domain, uh, the meristyl binding pocket is open, and this is open, so there is no auto-inhibition, and that's why there is leukemia. So, uh, as I told this before, and there is no uh, meristillated part, so the, uh, the APL is active, the CIBL is active, and there is leukemia. So, what uh, that time, so one of our collaborators, they gave this idea in 2003, first time, and then now I have screen some compounds and they found a gene if two of the compound, uh, and which was uh, published in Nature at that time. So they found that the gene if two is a compound which is not really a drug, but some compound which is binding to this place, and you don't need this meristillated form. So the, uh, you don't need meristillated APL and GDP2 can target or can inhibit the leukemia. So they did, they showed that very nicely. The problem with that was it was not inhibiting the resistant mutations. And at that time we have this uh, helix-2 compounds. Uh, so we combined this helix-2 with the GNF2 and we have nicely shown that helix-2 in combination with GNF2 nicely inhibiting the uh, proliferation of the leukemic cells in case and P3 to P3 I mutation. Also, you see here everywhere, uh, if you combine GNF2 with the helix 2, so you see in the black one, the leukemia is nicely inhibited. Leukemic cells are nicely inhibited. They also induce apoptosis in the cells and also reduce the colony formation in these cells. 
then we did the, some many other combination of this GNF2 and one combination worked nicely, which was the desartanib uh, combined with the, so this is second generation autoracine kinase inhibitor desartanib. And that was able to, um, uh, together they were able to inhibit the leukemic cells, even in the presence of T315 mutations. So I'm showing only one slide from each paper, so just to let you know that. Uh, so currently, like two, three years ago, uh, we screened many compounds and we found ALK inhibitor, which is approved for non-small cell lung carcinoma, the uh, crizotinib. Uh, crizotinib was a compound which was able, so in the screening, to target T315I. And finally, we found that this is working also is uh, elastoric compound. And you see that uh, uh, the T315I uh, mutation uh, positive cells are uh, inhibited. Uh, also, another uh, uh, mutation found like t 15 i and E255K, which is the challenge in the field because this is known as a compound mutation. So the same uh, gene or the same protein, BCRE bill, has two mutations, an ABL1 at position T315, the other at 255 and this compound mutation, all other compound mutations, they are a big challenges. So, but we found that the crizotinib is even uh, able to target even this compound mutation. Also in the mouse model, we have seen the, uh, it is increasing significantly the survival of the mice uh, with BCRA bill. So finally, signaling pathways. So this I will also combine with the, another uh, objective of my talk, which is mechanism of resistance. So I will uh, have like um, many uh, publication on the resistance mechanism, but I will show you one of the work which we have done like two, three years ago. Uh, so that was the, so just want to tell you like the leukemic stem cells is also a big issue in the relief. So leukemic stem cells, oncogene independence, so multiple mechanisms are there for the uh, resistance or for the relief. So for example, like uh, the, 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 the patient cells are this, the, the patient has a heterogeneous population of cells, including leukemic clones, leukemic stem cells, and other cells. So if we add like some inhibitor, for example, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, they, they target uh, the leukemic cells, but not the leukemic stem cells. So after some time, these cells, they give rise again to leukemic clone and there is a relapse. So what we and many other in the field, they are planning, they are trying to find some drugs or some combinations which can target the leukemic, the leukemic cells as well as the leukemic stem cells to completely treat the disease. So for this, what uh, one mechanism or one approach we planned was uh, to develop the resistant model. So we took the sub B15 cell line, which is established from the bone marrow of nine years old uh, ALL patient. Uh, we treated this, uh, these cells with the increasing concentration of imatinib to kill all the cells which are responding or, for example, uh, to, to develop a model which is uh, also present in the clinic, like some patient, they are coming, uh, they are taking the drug, and after some time, they are not no more responding to this drug. So the plan was to develop such model. So we developed a sub-B15 resistant model and then we also, because only one model is not enough for a complete mechanism, so we have uh, another um, uh, approach, which is uh, like we take the patient cells and we develop, we take the bone marrow of these from the patient and then we grow them for longer time. These cells, we say they are long-term uh, long patients, they are long-term culture, so they are uh, born in the serum free media and they are like very uh, so very stable till six months so they are re like recapitulating the, the patient material like the primary material so we we have different um, uh, like um, uh, mutation uh, resistant model for example some cells they are responding the other are not responding some are with mutation some are without mutation so they where we are using for different purposes. So we 
In the first model, the cell B15, you see here. So on the left side, you have wild type responsive cells. So they're responding to amartanib in basic concentration. So you see the IC50 is around uh, 200 or even less than 200 nanomolar. But if we treat them for amartanib for longer time, they, so we develop a resistant model. And this model, in this model, we even uh, added 10 micromolar. So here, as I told, 200 nanomolar, and here 10 micromolar, which is I don't know exactly 20 times or 50 times more concentration of the drug, but these cells were not responding. So they were like, uh, this is a model where the imatinib is not working. So we tested these cells with different uh, drugs, for example, nilotinib, uh, dosartinib, ponartinib, and so many, and even, for example, ponartinib, which is very, very potent, and here they are also not responding. It means they are uh, giving uh, resistance to all available drugs. So to find the mechanism of this resistance, this is a question in the field because there are nearly 30% of the patients who have um, um, who are not responding, but the, the mechanism is not known. So we like we investigated where if there is some uh, known mechanism, for example, the, the karyotyping of these cells. So we did this m and we found that there was no additional cell genetic aberration. Both are like, okay, so both are not very stable, but both are similar. We, we, we searched for mutation in ABL and we didn't find any uh, additional mutation in the ABL in both the cells. So this is this means that this is a mutation, a non-mutational resistance. Uh, we also look for the uh, the expression of the BCR well, for example, for the amplification of the gene, and we found that both are expressing similarly BCR well. So, and uh, you see here, this is the real time BCR, and here in the Western blood, both are expressing similarly BCR well. So, it means that these cells have uh, have some additional or some new mechanism of resistance. So, then we screen. And we found that uh, a, a pathway known PA3 kinase, AKT pathway, uh, so 4 EBP1 was responsible as a protein uh, or is a component of the AKT pathway, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, is responsible for this uh, resistance. And if you see here that if you give imatinib, so you decrease the phosphorylation of the AKT. Uh, if you give nilotinib, again, you see there is inhibition of the phosphorylation of the AKT. So AKT pathway is respond, uh, responding or is inhibited with the martinib and nilotinib in the wild type sub B15 cells. But if you add this concentration or even more concentration to the uh, T3, the sub B15 resistant cells, so you see that there is no inhibition of the AKT, even with the nilotinib, which means that uh, this uh, pathway is responsible for such uh, resistance. We did different screening and there are a lot of data, but I'm showing here one of the slides here. Uh, so then uh, there is a drug available, not drug inhibitor available, uh, which is known for in one, which is uh, the inhibitor of the 4 ebp one the component of this pathway. And we use that if this pathway is involved or if in for AKT pathway is in involved, so they should respond. And we found that in wild type cells, they were responding very nicely, but also surprising, not surprisingly, but uh, very nicely, they, the subutin resistant cells uh, also responded to uh, turin-1, which confirmed uh, that this pathway is uh, responsible for such resistance. Uh, here is the similar experiment. So, um, the upper one are the XTT proliferation assay, and the lower one are the growth curves. You see, with the increasing concentration, the cells are not going anymore. Uh, as I told, that the long term culture, the patient material we use, so pH cells, they are responsive to imatinib and many other drugs. But the PV, which is a model like cell resistance, resistant, with, without any known mechanism or without any known mutation. They are also not responding to imatinib or many other drugs. So we use them and we found that the turin one uh, is also able to uh, inhibit DB cells. So it means that uh, the, the, this pathway is really important for such type of resistance. 
So summary of this part is that uh, eukaryotic protein is selective and protein inhib inhibitor for resistance AML and ALL. Elastoric inhibitor of is a potential drug for respiratory CML. Uh, AKTM2 has role in non-mutational resistance, and the helix uh, inhibit BCR B positive cells. Uh, the second, uh, the third part objective of this is gene editing. Uh, project which I'm working on currently, uh, generating beta thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. So this is the title of this is developing drugable generating tool for treating beta thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. Uh, I have two funded projects, one by World Bank and the other with, uh, by Welcome Leap. Uh, so blood disorders are like, uh, you know, you know that there are the, the very common is sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia and they are Different in, uh, in shape, the cells are looking like uh, sickle, and in the beta thalassemia, they are not like donut shape, they are deformed. So, the disease, according to the study, is uh, these both diseases are very common in Pakistan. Uh, and in Pakistan, the thalassemic patient, uh, uh, like 10,000 um, babies, are born with beta thalassemia. And we have about 100,000 registered uh, thalassemic patients, and there are a number of sickle cell anemia patients, but uh, the data is from Pakistani literature or some other literature. So, uh, but there should be more because there are many, many not reported. So, um, beta thalassemia, uh, like sickle cell anemia, is like very simple, is a very point, single point mutation. Uh, but in beta thalassemia, there are multiple mutations. So one mutation or one variant is enough for one patient. There are nearly 800 known mutation uh, in beta thalassemia. And here is like, for example, one example or one point mutation is enough uh, to cause the complete disease. I know we have been born. So, but in Pakistan, we have these four or five uh, mutation which are very common and they are covering like nearly 90% uh, of the disease. So in nearly 90% of the patient we find these mutations. Our treatment uh, of this disease is uh, like very challenging and there is a blood transfusion. So that is a management and the problem with that is blood group mismatch there is always iron overload, which lead to the cardiac arrest and many other organ damage. Uh, there is supply and demand. Uh, Sometimes we don't find uh, blood and risk, uh, risk of infection and the cost. So there is $1,200 per year per individual, the cost, and together per 100,000 patients, it is like $120 million per year. Uh, the, the, the the promising uh, treatment is the treatment impact for beta thalassemia is the uh, allogeneic transplantation, like the transplantation of the uh, patient with the bone marrow cell from the other patient, uh, not uh, other individual from the healthy. And there are also many challenges. For example, require a match donor. There are limited transplant unit in the country, and there is associated mortality and morbidity and the cost is very high, $22,000 per individual. And if we want to transplant all the 100,000 patients, uh, there will be a billion cost, dollar cost. So what is the mitigating strategy? Uh, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing and new technology, like some year, like 2013, 14, it was started. And these two ladies, they got the Nobel Prize in 2020 in this field. So how this CRISPR-Cas9 is working? So CRISPR-Cas9 is, uh, as I told, a gene editing tool. Uh, there are uh, two components of the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, protein, and there is a guide RNA. The guide RNA further has a tracer RNA and a CRISPR RNA. So the CRISPR RNA is 18 or 20 nucleotide, which are uh, like um, uh, which have homology with uh, uh, with the host, and if the if you see here, 
uh, because of this CRISPR, I make it bind to the, the mutated or to the part of the genome where you want it, but it but here in the trace or in the group, the case nine here. And so you see there, there's a binding of this, and after this binding, uh, the case nine is coming there and it is you know, deleting both the strands. You see, so both the strands are deleted. And after this deletion, there is a, uh, a cell repair mechanism, and this is repaired, but because of the end of insert and deletion, there is no sense of membership mutation, and there is, you see that there is silent signal the gene. So this is a very easy and a way to um, correct or to So this one was for the silencing, the second one was the corrective. So you delete here, so both the strands are deleted, and there this is simply a cut in place. So there are two cut, one one side, and the end uh, like the five prime, the other is at the three prime, and this deletion is uh, so the part is deleted, and a new uh, with the non-mutated or with the correct sequence is introduced in the CRISPR Cas9. So it's introduced. And it bind there, and there is no mutation anymore. So we can use this for like for uh, correcting the thalassemic mutation, or the other way. I will tell you now how we can use the silencing mechanism. So the experimental plan for this one grant was to isolate the CD34 cells from the uh, patient. So the CD34 are the uh, hematopoietic stem cells. They are. Uh, isolated with the max magnetic associated cell sorting. They are grown. And on the other hand, we also isolate the skin biopsy and from the biopsy, uh, from this biopsy, we develop fibroblast. We reprogram them using the Manaka factor. Uh, we grow these cells and together these cells, for example, hematopoietic stem cells and also the IPCs, we uh, uh, transduce them, these cells with the crispr cas um, um, system and this gene is edited. And so we bring them back to the mice before characterization and we find whether the hemoglobin are produced or not. So we do the karyotype and we do the in vivo characterization sequencing and all other studies whether the hemoglobin are produced or not. So this is the ex vivo method, but we want to do this further for us. Uh, is in view method. So we want to load the crispr cas 9 on the exosome or the liposomes or to uh, modify the Cas9 with the transduction or using the also the organic metallic. So one of them, uh, any one of them work will be okay for us. So use the uh, prime editing or the, so the, the next project, my project is now with the prime editing. So I'm using here not the crispr cas but the prime editing. So load them and then introduce that to the cells or in direct to the mice, and we'll see that there should be in view uh, silencing or in view correction of the gene. So the, the previous one was X view. We take the cells out, we correct the cells, we reinfuse them. But in this case, we uh, we are directly introducing them to the uh, in view system. So one. Um, Story about the fetal hemoglobin is uh, I will tell you about that. So the in the womb, the, the baby depend on the fetal hemoglobin. This fetal hemoglobin after some after birth they are going down, and the adult hemoglobin are produced. So this is okay for a healthy individual, but in the case of the leukemic patient, if there is no adult hemoglobin and no fetal hemoglobin, they can't survive without blood transfusion. So therefore. Uh, it, it has a very rich history, like people who have uh, a fetal hemoglobin and they are thalassemic, so their prognosis is better. So because of that, people try to, find, to, to continue the fetal hemoglobin after birth, and one uh, gene, one BCL11A gene, is responsible for this, uh, uh, for, for expression of the, uh, for the fetal hemoglobin, uh, repression. So this BCL11A gene, if you target this gene, so there will be if 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 you if you target this um, uh, BCL11A gene, the fetal hemoglobin will be continuously there. So it means that a, a BCL11A gene, if this is on the hemoglobin A, the adult hemoglobin, they are on. 
they are there, but the feeder and labial are not there. But if you uh, block this BCL11 A gene replace, then uh, you will find hemoglobin F and hemoglobin A header will not be there, or less hemoglobin uh, header hemoglobin will be there. So the so people are working on that, and now uh, the therapy is also developed. Uh, like some therapies are also uh, like approved. So what we did is there are different exons of the bcl 11 a gene. So people are trying, people delete an exon two, and if you delete this, the whole bcl 11 a gene is gone, and there are problems with some diseases, for example, also differentiation of the hematopoietic cells to the terminal cells. So what we plan to delete the C terminus, which is exon four, and which is found also in the many uh, isoforms uh, and to compare whether exon 4 is working or not or only the exon 2. So we work on both, but for us, uh, the important thing was to find the, the, the exon, which is the C terminus uh, to not target the whole BCL on aging. So I'm showing one, two slides here. And if you see here, the first, the left side, you see here, this is the guide RNA developed and how it's developed uh, for this purpose. Uh, then we transduce the cells. So we isolated the cell with the marks, as I told, with the CD34 cells. Uh, these are hematopoietic stem cell, and then we transduce this cell with the um, uh, with this uh, CRISPR-Cas9 system. We find found that these cells are positive. Some cells are positive, and then we confirm that with the uh, different uh, 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 like the deletion with the with the PCR, uh, and also confirm that with the T7 assay. Uh, we also sequenced the, with the Sagnar sequencing and we found that there is a nice deletion. And if you see here, the EC11A protein level is also inhibited. You see in here and also here compared to the control. Uh, and also uh, the real-time PCR, you see here that the whole change of the fetal hemoglobin unlike is increased here. So it's here, the gamma. Uh, so if you compare all the three, uh, for example, both the beta and the gamma, for example, the fetal hemoglobin and the adult hemoglobin, and you see here, compared to control and also compared to the exon 4, we have more fetal hemoglobin uh, when we delete the exon 4. And the Western blot, you see here also that in the, uh, in here, uh, you see that uh, we have like uh, more, uh, fetal hemoglobin compared to exon 2 and also to the control. Next, uh, what we did this for, uh, the reason was uh, to find whether the effect of the exon 2 or the other people that are doing the PCL on a whole is any difference. We have like uh, a problem with differentiation or with the growth of the cells. And if you see here, this is the series 34 positivity of the cell initially. And later on, when we differentiated these cells, uh, using different protocols, and we found that these cells are nicely differentiated. Even the exon 4 are better, you see here. Uh, and then we uh, see, you see here the CD71 and CD235A, which are the marker for red blood cells, and they are the exon 4 are working better. Uh, e nucleation is also good. You see, like they are uh, like losing the nucleus because the red blood cells they don't have nucleus, so there was an exon 4 was even better than exon 2, and the proliferation was also good, very nice. You see here that there was no difference in the expansion. For example, we deleted the uh, gene, and if there is any effect on the growth of the cells, so we can find any using the exon 1, they are like control. So it was like it worked very nicely. Uh, in the so uh, hemoglobin, fetal hemoglobin, and adult hemoglobin, we uh, uh, investigated using. So, May I think so one or two slides left. So you see exon four, uh, the fetal hemoglobin are more in the uh, compared to the four and even to the exon two. We have more fetal hemoglobin. And the final uh, like the ultimate goal is to develop a novel therapy for ST in beta thalassemia, which is druggable therapy. For example, uh, what I told you that to load the CRISPR Cas9 on the uh, particles, nanoparticle, and directly introduce that to the patient and treat the patient perfectly. So I'm fortunate to have the international collaborators, for example, T.P. McKenzie, the one which is who, who is known for the in utero transplantation in alpha thalassemia. So there are some uh, mm -hmm. some of our patients, they are now healthy. Uh, 
So Neil Shah, very mm. well in leukemia, Olior Ortman, part of the many drug development uh, mm. of drug. Magna Boris from Norway and Tim Weiser from Pfizer and BioNTech. I'm also thankful to uh, the group, leukemia group, who worked with me and on the right side on the beta thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. Uh, and I'm very thankful.